गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन बिस्मिल्लाहमान रहीम देर इट वॉज अ लिटिल डिले इन माई लेक्चर प्रोग्राम सो आई एम हैप्पी टू गिव यू द लेक्चर आफ्टर अ ब्रीफ इंटरप्शन so the today's lecture is on psychodermatology and psychocutaneous diseases psychodermatology is an increasingly recognized and important branch of dermatology it encompasses encompasses the diseases that involves the complex interaction between the brain cutaneous nerves the cutaneous immune system and the skin most patients with psychocutaneous diseases are reluctant to attend purely psychiatric clinics for these reasons over the last few decades this sub specialty of uh, um of psychodermatology has emerged to address the clinical and academic needs of this group of patients skin and psychic interactions may be any of the following a primary cutaneous disorder that can be substantially influenced by psychological factors like stress and anxiety and maladjustment for example psoriasis or a primary psychiatric disease presenting to a dermatology healthcare professional for example delusional infestations or body dysmorphic disorders then psychiatric illness developing as a result of skin disease for example depression and anxiety full fledged depression or anxiety developing after a skin disease then comorbidity of skin diseases with another psychiatric disorder for example alcoholism the psychological comorbidities of chronic skin disease and the golden rule of psychodermatology the psychological stress is an integral cause of skin disease either as an initiating or an exacerbating factor leading to increase in disease morbidity it is therefore essential that skin condition is treated concomitantly with psychological comorbidities or the psychiatric or psycho psychological etiology this lead to the golden rule of psychodermatology number 1 exclude the organic diseases first before labeling a patient as a psychiatric patient and appropriately assess and treat the dermatological diseases at the same time as appropriately assessing and treating the psychological disease so both the two factors should be tackled in combination the dermatological diseases that have a strong psychological morbidity these include atopic eczema usually the atopic children and adolescents show anxiety from the very early childhood and they handle the situation less well and are provoked to anger and stress is a known factor that makes atopic eczema worse so the psychotherapy have a part to play in the treatment plan then psoriasis psoriasis is a lifelong skin disease hence anxiety depression and suicidal ideation are more common in patient of psoriasis than with eczema acne or alopecia particularly when there are when there are family problems and marriage troubles because of the disease depression is particularly significant and patient need to be treated holistically chronic spontaneous urticaria have a significant effect on quality of life it is significantly associated with depression dysthymia and anxiety alopecia areata or rather you can say alopecia universalis or totalis and here in addition to the management of the grieving process the psychosocial implication 
of living with hair loss is very much part of managing the patient's disease. Stigmatization, visible difference and coping strategies. The term psychodermatology describes a situation of an individual who is disqualified from a full social acceptance. Those events may occur early. For example, those afflicted by congenital skin problems or later as individuals with acquired visible skin disease. Stigmatization may be an issue following individual behaviors and social factors just such as substance abuse and unemployment. Or stigmatization may be associated with psychiatric diseases. In addition, there are population prejudice of ethnicity and religion. So you can see the psychological overlay of many disorders that are congenitally present, for example, a congenital melanocytic nevus or a port wine stain or an acquired disorder like a burn or scars following severe acne. So stigma in psychiatry. The measurement of stigma in dermatology and psychiatry has tended to rely on the general measures of mental health with depression and anxiety score, but also with psychometric measures of cell esteem, such as the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. This has been used to assess stigmatization in psoriasis and eczema, as well as the mental illnesses. The interventions in dermatological stigma are concentrated on firstly, the reduction of the visibility and secondly, the psychological based approach to forestall the stigmatization. So uh, we as a dermatologist should concentrate on our part, that is to treat the patient as effectively and as quickly as possible. And then since the psychological effect of the disease will take time to resolve, so the first motivation would be the treatment of skin disease. And then the psychiatric issues can be uh, tackled by yourself or by referring the patient to a uh, psychiatrist. Help for stigmatization begins with information control from both the physician and the family. Self-help and contact with patient advocacy group can be invaluable. The patient advocacy groups are not present generally in Pakistan or in other Asian countries. They are very common in the West and these groups are very helpful for patients suffering from chronic skin diseases with associated psychological overlay. Methods to change entrenched reactions within the society to physical and psychological differences are more defect, difficult to evaluate. And this is possible in educated environments and societies, but it is very difficult in our societies where the people tend to point out to the defects of the patients. Disability, quality of life and assessment in psychodermatology. The quality of life, QOL, is defined as the individual's perception of their position in life in context to the culture and value system in which they live and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards, and concerns. The dermatologists increasingly understand that physical disease and QOL are intimately but not linearly associated with them. The amount of skin disease though does not correlate with extent of the psychosocial comorbidities, nor does the greater disease extent and longevity necessarily correlates with low QOL. Some people have a good coping strategies and they uh, score less, uh, score more in the QOL, uh, with, uh, despite of having the disease since a very long time. And few people, they are bad in coping with the disease. So managing patient holistically means that clinicians must be able to assess how the patient is feeling and what is the impact of their disease in their QOL. So even if a patient does not have a very extensive disease, but is scoring low in QOL, such patients need aggressive and, aggressive and uh, better treatments, rather systemic treatments 
um, in play in place of the topical treatments which we usually advise to our patients initially. There is a growing interest in cumulative QOL assessment, lifetime QOL. For dermatologists, this scale is a little different. It's called as DQOL or Dermatology Quality of Life Index. There are some very short screening tools. For example, the Generalized Anxiety Disorder, GAD, two question screen. If a patient answer affirmatively for either of the following questions, further assessment will become important. So the question one is, during the past four weeks, have you been bothered by feeling worried, tense or anxious most of the time? And question two, are you frequently tense, irritable or having trouble sleeping? So if any of the two questions is answered as yes, then the patient should be further evaluated on the anxiety scales. There is an increasing recognition that it is not just the life of the patient affected by a skin disease, but also lives of the family, their partners, their carers and loved ones who are often affected by the patient's journey through the treatment. The growing interest in the cumulative QOL score and meta-analysis of QOL tools is now gaining popularity. The definition of the psychocutaneous diseases, these are the primary psychiatric diseases with skin manifestation. It has almost a 30% prevalence and patients with psychocutaneous diseases routinely refuse mental health resources and leaving the burden of care upon the dermatologist, which is definitely a very tricky as well as troublesome issue. So the clinical perspectives which we are going to discuss are the delusional diseases, the factitious diseases, the obsessive compulsive disorders, the eating disorders, the psychogenic pruritus and cutaneous sensory pain syndromes, post-traumatic stress disorder and sleep-wake disorders. So the first disease we are going to discuss is the delusional infestations. In delusional infestations or DI, also known as the delusion of parasitosis, the patient have a fixed and false belief that they are infested with parasites or have foreign objects extruding out from their skin. It's a monosymptomatic delusion in that most patients hold no other delusional belief. For example, schizophrenia. So the only delusional belief is the presence of insects in the skin. No other delusional belief. Depression, anxiety, and substance abuse is common in such patients, and it is scaled at on DSM-5 as somatic type. Some special forms of delusional infestations exist. DI as a shared delusion, fully, fully deox. The family members, carers, friends may believe that the two are infested or delusionally share the belief of individual who is presenting with the delusional infestations. And this is common. And such cases is, are, is difficult to handle because, because the support from the family and relatives is zero because all of them are suffering from the same delusional ideas. Then delusional infestation by proxy. Patient complain that their child, pet or friend is infested despite all evidence to the contrary. Then delusional infestation may be primary with no underlying cause or secondary to concomitant organic or psychiatric diseases. Approximately half of the patient is present with delusional infestations with secondary causes. However, the patient lives are extremely disabled by their disease. They often find themselves unemployed, in debt. And for example, some patients in an attempt to rid their homes of the infesting organisms, repeatedly buy new furniture and carpets, get isolated as loved ones may become more and more ex uh, uh, um, separated and distraught. Many patients go to great lengths to wash or clean their bodies. The term used prior to DI are now inappropriate as they refer to as phobias. Delusional infestation is a delusion, not a phobic disorder. 
and parasitosis. The delusional infestation patients present with the range of infecting organisms and animate material, not just parasites. So it is not parasitosis. So the best term for these are is delusional infestations. The peak incidence is between 20 to 30 and above 50 years of age. Fully de uh, deox shares symptoms with friend or relative is common in 8 to 12 percent of the patient. Pathophysiology. Functional MRI in DI patient indicate that there may be abnormalities in cortical and midbrain areas associated with interpretation of perceptions. So there is some organic cause as well. The involvement of dopinergic and midbrain structures and therapeutic efficacy of antipsychotic D2 dopamine antagonist may indicate the dopaminergic dysfunctions in DI. Predisposing factors, there may be genetic predisposition for patients with primary and secondary DI, secondary to psychiatric disease, and patients with DI may be more likely to be socially isolated. So this is a list of diseases in which DI is secondarily associated with other conditions. Usually DI as a primary disorder does not have any uh, disease association. So DI secondary to organic diseases include the substance abuse, alcohol or recreational drugs, prescribed medications like anti-Parkinsonian medications like uh, Ropinrol, then infections, tuberculosis, HIV, endocrine disorders, thyroid diseases, cancers, hematological cancers, chronic or acute liver failure, renal failure, vitamin B12 deficiency, autoimmunes like SLE, multiple sclerosis, brain disorders, cerebrovascular disease, and Parkinson disease. And DIA secondary to psychiatric disease includes schizophrenia, bipolar with psychotic symptoms, borderline personality disorders, and anxiety disorder. The clinical features. Crawling, biting, and stinging. Pins and needle sensations is what the patient describes commonly to the physician. Patient describes elaborate and um, very um, novel kind of life cycles of their parasites. They bring specimens as a sign or proof of infestation. And they give history of use of pesticides, disinfectants, and topical medications to cure the infestation. It is crucial that the healthcare professionals carefully examine the skin of the patient with suspected DI to check for genuine infestations. Secondly, it is important to exclude the differential diagnosis of DI. It is common to find the extraction attempts on the body that, that is trying to remove the organism with a fingernail or a tool with erosions. Tool can be a key. It can be a, it can be a, a knife resulting in ulcers, nodules, and even lichenification. So this is a specimen sign. Usually, most of the DI patients will bring some proof of their claim. Many will bring along specimen of organism that they are believed um, infesting them. This is was used to be called as the matchbox sign because at little time back, matchboxes were commonly seen in houses and people used to bring this specimen in a matchbox. But more recently, the clinicians have recognized that the patients have access to sophisticated equipments and may bring along high-tech audio or computer images of material they have themselves analyzed. This has been termed now as the specimen sign. Skin debris and specimen material may be analyzed by microscope in the local microbiology laboratory. A catalog of normal results which assist the patient in understanding that the clinician understands the patient's experience and continue to seek and exclude a genuine infestation. So right away, um, right away snubbing the patient and telling that 
whatever he has brought is totally rubbish, is a very wrong call. So this material should be given a due respect and the patient should be told in a polite manner that there is no worm or in, 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 uh, insect in this material. So this kind of erosion the patient has made uh, just in order to remove that uh, infection. The differential diagnosis include the primary skin diseases like scabies or bites, exclude neurological diseases or substance abuse, exclude dementia, malignancies, CVS diseases and vitamin B12 deficiency, and sometimes do a skin biopsy to rule out any organic cause. So the management. Management includes engagement of patient in management of DI. The healthcare professional must develop a sympathetic and understanding approach to the patient. It is usually futile to try to straight away reject the validity of their claim of infestation. The patient will never turn up again if you do so. The choice of antipsychotic medication is often based on the patient's age, comorbidities, and lifestyle rather than direct comparison of efficacy. The most psychodermatologists now avoid pimozide due to its cardiotoxic risks. Instead, most recommend the atypical antipsychotics as the first-line treatment together with treatment of skin and any other comorbid affective disease. So the first-line antipsychotic is chosen according to the lifestyle of the patient. Risperidon, which is available with the name brand name of Risp, or Olen Olenzepine, which is available. I have mentioned the brand name because these are not the common drugs which we use. So you, people may be aware of the brand names like Olenz, Olenza, or Zopara. Then Emisulopride. Then Qtiapine, which is available with a brand name of Qsip. Then an Eripiprazole with a brand name of Eripa. Emollients that contain antiseptics, assessment of risk, suicidality, and effective diseases, and referral to substance abuse unit if appropriate. Second line, the Pimozide is now a second line drug available with the brand name of Aurep because of its cardiotoxicity. Haloperidol may be used, tricyclic antidepressant for itch sensations. Antidepressant usually SSRIs if there is coexisting effective disease. Phototherapy or antibiotics if genuine bacterial super infection is established. Third line is, of course, the psychotherapy, uh, but patients may not adhere to this line of treatment. The next disorder which are, we are going to discuss is the Morgellon syndrome. The Morgellon was described by Sir Thomas Brownie in 1674 in a population from Languedoc, one of whose characteristics was the development of a hairy back. Nevertheless, this name was coined to, an, to entitle a syndrome, set up a research foundation, raise funds, and generate vast media and internet interest. This phenomena or Morgellon phenomena comprises of sensations of crawling, stinging, and biting under the skin, sores that do not heal, fiber-like filaments, granules, or crystals that appear on or under the skin lesion, joint and muscle pain and fibromyalgia, debilitating fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, poor concentration, and memory. U.S. Center of Disease Control has set up an independent study to evaluate the phenomena and has concluded there is no objective evidence for the unexplained dermatopathy. Treatment response to pimozide and risperidone have been recorded together with treatment of skin with topical antiseptics, systemic antibiotics, and sometimes phototherapy. Then we are going to discuss 
a number of diseases in which the primary issue is an obsessive and compulsive compulsive behavior. The body dysmorphic disorder, formerly knows, known as the dysmorphophobia. The body dysmorphic disorder, abbreviated as BDD, is characterized by a preoccupation with a real or imagined defect in the physical appearance or if there is a slight physical anomaly, the concerns is out of proportion to that anomaly. That is, patient may have a shorter eyebrow, but the psychological impact of that eyebrow is immense. Comorbidities like other OCDs and substance-related disorders are common. This is a difficult group of patients to treat. One of the main obstacles being that most patients lack the insight and will not accept psychiatric treatment or refer. The BDD is very disabling for the patients and for those around them since the focus on their perceived effect seems illogical but is also unshakable and up to 25% of the patient will act on their suicidal ideation on these perceived um, somatic defects. Patients are therefore best seen in a joint psychodermatology clinic where possible so that the patient do not have an idea that they are being seen by a psychiatrist. Epidemiology, the body dysmorphic disorder occur in 1 to 2 percent of the general population and is very common in aesthetic dermatology clinics as 14 percent of the aesthetic dermatology patients have some body dysmorphic disorder. So, um, warning for all the aesthetic physicians that take care of these patients. These are always unsatisfied patients and try not to uh, do very elaborate treatments in such patients. Peak onset is 15 to 16 years of age. The screening questions to assess the body dysmorphic disorder. How much do you currently think about your skin? On average days, how many hours do you spend thinking about your skin? Do you feel your skin is ugly or very unattractive? How Noticeable, do you think your skin is? Does your skin currently cause you a lot of distress? How many times a day do you usually check your skin, either in a mirror or by feeling it with your fingers? How often, often do you feel anxious about your skin in social situations? Does it lead to your avoiding social, social, social situations? Has your skin had an effect on dating or an existing relationship? Has your skin interfered with your ability to work or study or your role as the homemaker? So among all these questions, if the patient answer any four or more, then it is considered to be suffering from the body dysmorphic disorder. The clinical features. Patient with body dysmorphic disorder may present with symptoms according to their gender. Women may present with focus on skin of the face, breasts, nose and stomach, where men present with concerns about their hair, usually thinning, then nose, ear, genitals and body build. The facial symptoms are common, but patients with body dysmorphic disorders may perceive defect affecting any part of their body, but concerns about the hair that is too much, too little, or hair in wrong places are common. Patient focus on their perceived defects is notoriously tenacious. Fixed. Patient will often behave in the following way. They socialize poorly, have difficult in relationship with have difficult relationship with mirror having to brace themselves to look in a mirror or avoiding mirrors completely, pick at their skin, hide their defects by masks or other um, maneuvers, 
have a very persistent or intuitive thought about their perceived defects, repeatedly seeking help from different doctors. They are doctor shoppers, repeatedly attending for cosmetic and aesthetic surgery. Familial BDD, where patients impose a delusional idea upon a child who in turn develop BDD, or even more rarely, patients believe that the child has a bodily defect that is BDD by proxy. The differential diagnoses include social anxiety disorders, major depressive disorders, other OCDs, and BDD can differ from SED in that patients will avoid socializing because of reject or ridicule because perceived idea of reject or ridicule because of their physical appearance. The management. The first line management is an empathetic approach. As always, patients with psychodermatological diseases need to have their skin and their psychological disease treated concurrently. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and CBT are the treatment of choice. Fluxetine, Flovox, Fluvoxamine and citeropram are the best studied SSRIs in these patients. Then talk therapies. These are various CBT techniques that can be used in the management of BDD and supportive psychotherapy is helpful in these patients. The second line treatment include some newer or atypical antipsychotic like resperidone or apriprazole. Lichen simplex chronicus and nodular prurigo, the neurodermatitis or pickers nodules. The lichen simplex describes the characteristic localized skin thickening in response to repeated rubbing and scratching. In some instances, a minor initiating events such as trauma, infection or an insect bite precipitates the episode of insistent scratching and rubbing. This irresistible itching is the major complaint and scratching the chronic accomplishment. Nodular prurigo is more generalized and complex. It generally falls into two categories, the nodular prurigo in atopic patients and patients who, have chronic, who are chronic skin pickers. Epidemiology. The lichen simplex chronicus and nodular prurigo are both common, occurring in between 1% and 10% of the population. Patients probably represent two populations, the early onset atopic group and the later non-atopic group with a mean age of 48 years. These diseases are common in women as compared to men. Clinical features. There is regular rubbing or pressure on the skin, producing characteristically thickened, coarsely grained papules and nodules with hyperpigmentation. The classical site of enrollments are those which are easily accessible to the patient, like nape of the neck, side of the neck, the elbows, thighs, knees, and ankle. Patches of lichen simplex chronicus affects vulva and scrotal skin quite commonly. Scratching or rubbing is carried out by using hands, back of nails, or sometimes use of a convenient instrument such as hairbrush, keys, or pen. The change from itch to pain is quite sudden. An abrupt cessation has been described as the orgasm cutanee. Patients are usually described as stable, but anxious individuals. Aggression and hostility related to anxiety caused by emotional disturbance may lead to itching. Habitual scratching is often opportunistic. That is when patient can get out, patient can get to their skin and become addictive, so potentially out of control. So if you take the history, simple history that, do you feel this itch when you are alone? Or do you feel the same itch when you are working in the office? They would say that they would not feel the itch during the working time. So this is an opportunistic itch. This is the picker's nodules or nodular prurigo. The treatment letter. The first line treatment for the skin is emollients and anti-inflammatory ointments like steroid or calcineurin inhibitor or TARS. For itching, antihistamines, tricyclics for amitriptyline or doxepin, 
or topical antiprolytics like menthols. For the habit, habit, which is crucial, that is habit reversal and other talk therapies. So habit reversal is only positive with, possible with psychotherapy. Second line treatment for the skin include phototherapy or photochemotherapy or PUVA. Then of the itch, SSRIs or mood stabilizers like pregabalin or gabapentin. Of the comorbidities, other antidepressants like mirtazapine, talk therapies. Third line include tying the patient with bandages and occlusion. Systemic treatment like cyclosporin, azathioprine, or intralesional steroids. Intralesional steroids is helpful in Picker's nodule because the sensation of itch will be subsided. Skin pricking disorder, neurotic excoriation, dermatotelomania, or psychogenic skin pricking. The disorder occur in 2% of dermatology patients. But the majority is associated with topics and other cutaneous diseases. Skin pricking disease in absence of cutaneous inflammatory disease is rare but still common. There are two peaks of occurrences. Number one in adolescence and early adult life and number two the middle-aged women. It is rare in young children and females are more affected than males. The lesion differ from other RT factual disorders as those who suffer admit to an urge to pick or go at their skin. Patients are willing to discuss the picking as a response to stress. Any area may be affected. Average duration of disease before presentation is up to 10 years. Patients spend up to 3 hours per day picking their lesions. Lesions are quite deep, extending into the dermis and more commonly disturbed within the reach sorry, distributed within the reach of the dominant hand. The older lesions show pink or red scars, some of which may be hypertrophic. Lesions appear at all stages of development and may number from few to several hundred. Up to a quarter of patients may increase alcohol, tobacco, tobacco or recreational substance habit to counter this burden of disease, which is again another issue. So these are the picking and cutting of the lips and face. The differential diagnosis is important to exclude the excoriation caused by generalized pruritus, the bullous disorders like pemphigus, and it can be the presenting sign of lichen planus or lupus erythematosus or other infestations. Another differential is acne excori, which we are going to discuss. Complications include cellulitis, bacteremia, and septicemia, scarring, anxiety, depression, and guilt, rarely cell mutilation, mutilating amputation of body structure, for example, breast, and suicidal ideations. Treatment letter for the skin, first line. Appropriate treatment include antibiotics if there is clinical infections, antihistamine for the itch, tricyclics if, if antihistamine does not help, and treatment of chronic pruritus by steroids and uh, topical and systemic. Of picking habit and comorbidities, the habit reversal, that is the talk therapies and SSRIs, usually in higher doses. Second line treatment for the skin is phototherapy or photochemotherapy. Then for the picking habit, mood stabilizers like pregabalin or gabapentin, other antidepressants like mirtazapine and talk therapies, bandages, occlusion, interlegional steroids, Lomotrichine and uh, topiramate. Acne excori. This is a common disease in young female. There are a few patients with acne who can cannot resist excusing their skin lesions. Broke described acne excori, particularly in adolescent girls under the emotional stress, who pick and excuse their acne lesions. Although some patients develop the lesions after picking acne, most have no acne at all. So if a patient comes to you and have lots of excoriation on the face, but no comedon, papule or pustule, then you should straight away think that this patient is having acne excori rather than having an active acne vulgaris. Acne excori is usually seen in young, often white women, with a second peak in women in their 30s. The clinical lesions resemble those of chronic excoriations. 
they are found predominantly around the hairline, the forehead, the pre-auricular cheek and chin areas. Extension to neck and occipital line is common. Chronic lesions characteristically show wide atrophic scarring with peripheral hyperpigmentation. Lesions are excoriated until emptied or removed. The skin is removed. There are usually some acneform lesions and at least when the disease first appears. Later on, there will be no acneform lesion. So you can see only excoriations on the face and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and scarring. No active acne lesion. Differential diagnoses include the trigeminal, trigeminal trophic syndrome and dermatitis artifacta. The treatment letter for the acne if is present, then topical retinoids or antibiotics and systemic antibiotics. For this habit of pricking, habit reversal, talk therapy and SSRIs. Second line for the acne is isotretinoin in low dosage, then phototherapy of habit and comorbidities under antidepressants like mitazapine, mood stabilizers like pregabalin and talk therapies. Third line is lasers and dermabrasion. Avoid intralinal steroids until the pricking habit is under control. Lomitrogene, topramate and hypnosis. Trichotillomania or trico or, or uh, trichotillosis. The term trichotillomania was first used by Helopio in 1889 and is derived from three Greek words, the trix meaning hair, the tillin means pull out and mania means madness. Current thinking is that the term trichotillosis is more accurate that the condition is not a mania but more of an OCD, spectrum disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. The diagnostic criteria that have been cited for trichotillomania include the recurrent pulling out of one own hair resulting in hair loss, an increased sense of tension immediately before pulling out the hairs or when attempting to resist the behavior, pleasure, gratification or relief when pulling out the hair, the disturbance is not better accounted for by another mental disorder, and disturbance provoke clinically marked distress and or impairment in occupational, social and other areas of functioning. Patient with earlier onset with limited progression usually have a better prognosis. Recalcitrant, obsessive and focused hair pulling is usually found in older women and patient may deny their hair pulling. Epidemiology, it is common in children and college students, rate 0.6 to 3%. Overall, later and more severe trichotillosis is not common. Cosmetic hair pulling like eyebrows is extremely common, but most do not fulfill the diagnosis of OCD criteria. There appear to be two distinct population, one between 5 to 12 years and adolescent or early adult life. The early onset group, that is between 2 to 10 years, show benign self-limiting behavior and most probably suffer a habit disorder. Adolescent group are more likely to be fem female and are more persistent. Etiologies of trichotillosis is not fully understood, but seems to be related to the following, some underlying anxiety, depression, or underlying body dysmorphic disease, psychological triggers, family dysfunctions, other cutaneous habits like nail biting and nail pulling, Deliberate self-harm or cutting, eating disorders, and substance abuse. Familial predisposition is fairly common. It is always worth considering the emotional or sexual abuse. Most patients relate that trichotillosis is compulsive and irresistible that lead to short-lived sense of relief, following by a sense of guilt and hopelessness. The habit is often hidden from the partner's close family and their hair loss is, is usually covered up. Most pull hairs are from the vertex, but temporal, occipital and frontal hair loss is also seen in children and more obvious on the side of the manual dominance, that is hand dominance. Hair loss may be minimal, more commonly a solitary patch, but visible hair thinning may progress to virtually total depilation 
significantly so in adult women. The eyelashes, eyebrow, facial, and pubic hairs may also be primarily affected. On examination, there are areas of hair loss together with areas of hair regrowth. This pattern may also involve the eyebrow and lashes. There is occasionally frank scarring from the area where this is done repeated. The pattern of plucking activity are centrifugal from a single starting point or linear in a wave-like activity. In extreme cases, patients remove all the hairs except thin hairs at the border of the scalp giving a tonsure pattern or the frere tuck distribution. That is balding in the center and a rim of hairs only at the periphery. The chronic folliculitis of the neck, chin, chest, pubic area or thigh, a result of the plugging activity may also be a presenting complaint. Children may plug the hair or stroke or suck the hair root before chewing and swallow the reminder. This is trichoschizophagia. Or the whole hair is eaten, which is trichophagia. Trichotillomania in this severely affected patient, there is much more obvious and extensive hair loss. A patchy hair loss. Complications and comorbidity. There is scarring, hair loss, folliculitis, keloids formation, then trichobuzar. The buzars are the ball-like aggregates of vegetable or fiber-like material in the stomach and small intestine. It is almost exclusively seen in girls and young women. This is seen in those young or anxious people who eat the uh, removed hairs. Longer hairs are more likely to become enmeshed into a ball by the action of peristalsis, and this then become too large to leave the stomach via the pylorus. This leads to gastric atony, leading to symptoms of nausea, indigestion, bloating, and pain. The Rupenzel syndrome, described as trichobuzar with tail, that extend at least to the jejunum, and sufferers are highly likely to have the gastrointestinal obstructive symptoms. The life-threatening intestinal obstruction necessitates the surgical intervention. So the investigation include diagnosis is usually clinical and scalp biopsy is rarely necessary. What is found in the biopsy, I'll tell you in the, pre in the following slides. In severe damage, there is an intraepithelial and perifollicular damage. So how this is how the trichotillomania horizontal section would look like. In addition, to the residual anagen follicles, these are the anagen follicles. There are conspicuous catagen follicles. These are the catagen. Uh, these are the catagen follicles. Sorry, these are the anagen follicles. These are the catagen follicles, and these are the telogen follicles. So, um, the follicle, the follicles are not all the follicles are catagen with bright eosinophilic center and no significant inflammation. So what is the problem um, histology here is, in trichotillomania, the most of the hairs enter into the catagen stage. So again, a catagen follicle is here. Again, a catagen follicle with marked apoptosis. There are two terminal hair follicles in the field with prominent internal root sheet. This follicle is a catagen follicle which has lost the internal root sheet and show intense yellow keratinization. This is an elastic state. The trichotillomania is it also have another characteristic that is dilatation with hyperkeratosis. And the follicles are left with empty pigment casts. These are the pigment casts. The treatment letter. The first line treatment for the habit is habit reversal or other CBTs. SSRIs in high doses is usually given. For hair loss, you can give hair weaves, hair extensions, treatment of iron deficiency and treatment of keloid. Second line include the mood stabilizers like gabapentine and pregabalin. Third lines are antipsychotics under psychodermatological supervision. Topramate, phototherapy, and referral to the dissociative state disorder clinics. 
Then comes the onychotillomania or onychophagia. This is somehow related to the uh, trichotillomania or trichotillomy. The compulsive habit of nail picking or onychotillomania and nail biting or onychophagia have been shown to be common in children and adolescents. The etiologies suggested include stress, intimation of family members, and transference from the thumb sucking habit. Usually, such kind of patients are stressed and weak personalities, and the nail biting is confined to nail fingernails, resulting in damage to cuticle and nail causing pharonychia, nail dystrophy, and longitudinal nail scarring. In chronic cases, there is an association with trichotillosis. Compulsive biting, tearing, or picking with instruments such as scissors, knives, or razor blades may lead to permanent destruction of the nails. In adult, chronic nail biting is more common and isol as isolation, self-destructive habit, which may respond to cognitive behavioral training. Nail biting, whole of the nail is lost, only this is the early or partial bite. So this comes to the end of this today's talk. I hope this was an informative lecture for you. And inshallah, next week, I'm going to complete this lecture as there are a few topics which are still left and uh, the lecture already has become too long. So thank you and have a very good day. Goodbye and have a good day.